Good afternoon. Today is August 3rd, and the program is Coronavirus in Our Mental Health. I'm Ken Burtness coming to you from Holly Eva on the North Shore. And today is a warm summer day, and our North Shore surf is quiet and serene up here. Uh, if you're looking for surfing waves, the uh, place to go is the South Shore. That's what I keep reminding the tourists, but the tourists don't listen to me. And they keep coming up here in droves. So we have a lot of them today up at the North Shore. People also don't listen to me much about coronavirus either. Uh, coronavirus is still with us. We are still in the pandemic. Now we are much lower than our highs, but we're much higher than our lows. If you take a look at the numbers uh, since January, when we had that big surge, we were having about 4,000 new cases every day here in Hawaii. Whoa. Now we dropped down to, in March, when we had our lows, we were down to 20 per day, which was terrific news. But today, uh, not only today, but in all of July, we've been averaging about 500 uh -huh. cases a day. So that's much lower than the 4,000, but much higher than the 20 that we had in March. So we're still here, but to everybody, we're out of the pandemic. I mean, people are not wearing, not many people are wearing masks. We're gathering in large groups and we're traveling a lot. Uh, that creates problems. And, uh, you know, we'll take a look nationally, for instance. Nationally in 2020, we had 400,000 Americans die in that year. 2021, we had another 400,000 Americans die. This year in 2022, so far we were over 200,000 deaths in this country, bringing us to over a million, which I reported on a couple shows ago. By the end of the year, the experts expect that we'll have another uh, 50,000 to go with that 200,000. So 250,000 deaths in 2020 is what they're anticipating. So we're still not out of the woods and we still have to take precaution and that's hard. People are just tired. They're tired of the lockdown. They're tired of coronavirus. Uh, they're tired of wearing masks and they're tired of staying home. They want to get out. So people are doing that and people are getting sick. I think many of you probably have had a close friend or a family member who in this past year and maybe recently like myself, uh, had family and friends who came down with COVID. And it's not, for most people, it's not a pleasant experience. So we still have to look for ways to deal with this. And one of the ways that we do that, and we've been doing it on this program, is we've been looking for things that are positive because our world now is full of negatives. I mean, we've got the coronavirus, we've got the war, we've got mass shootings, we've got climate change, we've got a whole bunch of things to make us feel very negative. Well, we need to start feeling positive about things and there's a lot of positive things happening. So today we're gonna to talk about the positivity about helping people, the joy that we get from helping people. And to help me with that is my good friend, Tony Barron, who's an expert in this area. Welcome to the show, Tony. Thank you, my dear. I'm glad you invited me. <laughs> it's just wonderful having you here. Now, Tony is a woman of many talents and many skills. She's a minister. She's also a healthcare professional. For many years, she ran a very successful tobacco cessation program. And for the last 38 years, she's been a volunteer in our prisons here on Oahu. And I've asked her to talk about that today because there's something very special about volunteering at our prisons. Our inmates are very at risk. They're what I, what I call the forgotten population. Uh, they're locked down and they're not going any place. They're not traveling like we are. Uh, and they're gonna be there for a while. And it's just very difficult. They're in close quarters and they really need uh, some helping hand. And Tony's been doing that. Tony, could you share a little bit about your, sort of the history of your experience? You've been with the prison system for over 20, 38 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. it's just a total joy. I 
look forward to ever I go to Halava on Friday mornings and Wayava on Saturday mornings. And it's just like getting together with family. Uh, we really are Ohana. And many of the men, I'm the only non-staff person they see, not only for years, but sometimes decades. And one of the things that I wanted to share uh, was my uh, initiation into the system. The volunteer coordinator, uh, he said, well, you know, I'll let you go in, but if, uh, if you think you wanna come back, I would ask one, one commitment from you. And that would be uh, that you will commit to six months of once a week coming in to see the men. He said, many of them have been taught, trained, believed that they are throwaway people. And that's what I wanna share with everyone is in the first place, uh, the people that come to my group, it's called a spiritual rap group, not rap as in singing, but in the old days, because everything I do is old. Uh, so rap just used to mean talk. So we have a spiritual rap group. We read um, uh, one word. The word might be prosperity or freedom or pets. It might be anything. And there's just a few paragraphs on it. And then we sit in a circle and the men go from uh, one man to the next saying what that idea, that concept, that thought is to them. And I thought, for example, that, oh, pets, what a, what a humbug word for these. They don't have their pets. They're not going to get any pets. What can we possibly talk about? Well, it was one of our best sessions because it lifted their spirits to remember their true loves you know, their dogs and being young again and all that. So, and, and, and that's that terrific, Tony. What, uh, just being there, you know, I did a, a, you know, I did nothing like Tony did, but I did a couple of years volunteering way back when, I hate to admit it, to the, in the 70s at, at the prison and just having somebody that listens to you and having some, some venue that you can talk and share your ideas with uh, is incredible. And uh, so, I yeah. mean, I can see where pets were being very uplifting. And I'm sure you've talked about many different things that if you've found uplifting with your men, maybe you could tell us some more of those uh, uplifting things. Oh, it, it, uh, how many days do you have? Uh, <laughs> so, so this is what I want to communicate to your listeners. And that is, these are the same people that live next door to you, that are relatives, that are your best friend, son, daughter, whatever. And because they're in prison and because they come to my group, in, um, they are people who are sober. They're not on drugs. Not that you can't get those in there, but that's another group of people that wouldn't be coming to my uh, spiritual rap group. So, and, and this is the feedback that I get from the men because there's all kinds of churches and various folks that go in to save, you know, the inmates. And the feedback that I get is that it's just so nice for them to be able to speak and to have somebody listen to them. So you really nailed it when you said, uh, give them a chance to talk. I, I haven't been to the other ministers that serve the inmates, but I feel sure that they stand up and give a sermon just like you do in church. Well, ours isn't like that. Everybody gets to talk. They all get to say, well, I believe it. I don't believe it. I like it. I don't like it. And, and somebody says, I heard you. Oh my goodness. It must be Christmas. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I was really interested, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the differences between Alava and uh, Wayaba. Um, I, with my short term of uh, volunteering for a couple of years, I volunteered at OCCC and a little bit at uh, Wayaba, uh, and they were quite different. Uh, and I was wondering if the two populations that you're with, the two groups that you're with, if they, they differ or if you find a lot of similarities between them. Yes and no, they're similar because they're locked up and put away and they're the throwaway people, yeah? So uh, 
let's see what I, where I want to, what I want to tell you. The difference for me is OCCC is when they're just getting into the system. Many of those people are pre-sentenced. Uh, why Halava is long term. They're there. They're not just one or two years. They're they're there for a while, and a lot of lifers. And then um, and they're mature. And many of them have been you know started out in not not orphanages but foster homes and things that um, they haven't had the same kind of background that you and I have with a family and stability and that kind of thing. And then the, that's the Halava and then the Wayava. Uh, those are people that have been probably in OCCC, then in Halava for years, and now when they go to Wayava, they can uh, get into a work program. You know, you see the guys on, alongside the road, you know, clearing the brush and m m mowing the yard and all that stuff. So uh, they, their mindset would be that they're just getting into it and they're probably scared to death because they, you know, watch too many James Cagney films, but it is a scary place for them. And then the um, Halava, they're pretty well set or settled in that they can unpack and know they're going to be there for a while. And then the Wayava, they're scared because the, the world they knew no longer exists. They don't even know how to use a telephone. You know, there's, there's, our world changes so fast out here. Um, so my heart really bleeds for them that uh, they get out of prison. They have no job. They have no home. They have no money. They have no, no springboard. They have no, you know, you can imagine. Yeah. This is the thing that really concerned me the most because when we look at statistics, recidivism is always high. Uh, here in Hawaii, as it is with every place else, a uh, person gets back into the real world, so to speak, outside of the prison system, and the first thing they want to do is celebrate. And oftentimes that celebration uh, causes a parole violation and they land right back into prison. Uh, and I know one of the key things that I talked about when I was volunteering, and I'm sure you did too, is is how do we adjust? How do uh, how can they get ready to deal with this uh, new world, like you're talking about, without being bounced back? Because that's the last thing that most well, of them want is to come back to prison. <laughs> right. So these people are scary they're, to the population, and they they have no confidence. They have nobody that trusts them anymore because they've hurt so many people in their past. So what we need to do as as the civilian population is give them whatever avenues are available to you to incorporate them into our everyday life. For example, one of the men that got out, he was on parole, but one of the men that got out, no money, no job, no ID, no driver's license, no nothing. Um, so uh, um, I gave him $20 to weed my garden. Big whoopee. Well, it is a big whoopee because I spent the afternoon with him and we had a meal together. And uh, the bottom line is just incorporate them in anything and everything you can, whether it's giving them a menial job or uh, uh, offer them a ride to church or to a bingo game or whatever you can to say, yes, you are uh, an important part of our community. Um, we, you're not damned forever because you made a mistake when you're 20 years old and you're just getting out when you're middle-aged. It's, they, they need your acceptance. They need you to, oh, now here's something I really want to share with your, with your audience. You know those tears that people uh, get tattooed on their face? For the most part, not always, but for the most part, that means somebody died, you know, gangland, foolishness, whatever. So I want to get with the powers that be that say, if you're getting out, and they all do sooner or later, let's erase those tears. You go to rent a room or get a job, uh, they're not going to want to see that on a, a server's face. Absolutely. Just makes it that much more scary, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's sort of uh, what I was always thinking about was that when we come back to the real world, we have to abandon some of the negative things that we were dealing with before we got into prison. And we've got to increase all the positive things that we were doing that we may have may have been avoiding. For instance, uh, oftentimes uh, I found that people had burned their bridges with their families and friends before yeah. uh, committing an antisocial act and winding up in prison. Yeah. That was one thing that I was always, if we could sort of re-help them build those bridges again and be connected with people who could support them, uh, that always seemed like a great way, but it's very difficult. Uh, well, and I don't envy you your job because that's really hard to do. And you don't want them to go back to their friends who got them in trouble in the first place either. So well, this it's is a double-edged sword. This is what I tell them on a regular basis. I say, this is the drum that you're going to he hear me beat just about every time I talk to you. And that is when you do get out, volunteer. I know that your, your self-esteem is probably very low. Your self-confidence may be lower. So when you get out, volunteer to cut the old lady's lawn next door. Volunteer at church to be an usher. Volunteer with a uh, any place all the time just to say, hey, I am a, a contributing person to this community. So volunteering is the name of the game for me. Absolutely. You know, and for people who are not uh, in prison, there's so many of us during the, uh, the coronavirus that have just become filled with feelings of impotency, of not being able to, you know, not having any confidence in ourselves and constantly being aware of our shortcomings. Right. And when I talk to these people, I try to convince them to go out and help other people so that they get thinking about other people, not just themselves. And by helping other people, they start feeling better about themselves, about what they're doing. And yeah, it may not be a job, it may be volunteering, but it's very important stuff during this particularly difficult time. So that, that would be great if you could get them to do that. And, uh, 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 you probably have some uh, examples of some people who wound up volunteering and, and improving because of that. Absolutely. Whatever, we, whatever they can give back, they don't have money for the most part. They, uh, a lot of them don't have jobs that they can go back to. They don't have respect. They, and the people that they hurt are usually the ones closest to them, their families and sweethearts and kids and all that. So nobody wants to trust them. They say, yeah, you've told me you're sorry about a thousand times. You told me that you wouldn't do it again. Now this is your sixth time. So, but I think one of the things that changes with the men is when they age. As they get into real maturity, real adulthood, um, they're not trying to be the top gun in the, on the block, you know? So that makes it easier for them but they still have to have our, what's the word, receptability. They still have to have us say, yes, you're welcome. Uh, you know, I trust you to come into my house. I trust you to mow my lawn. I trust you to wash my car. You know, it sounds like they only do menial jobs and it's not true. It's just, that's what's coming to mind for me. But these men are, Many are highly intelligent, creative, they're been business owners, um, bosses, you know, so. Yeah, and they do have that, you know, that was the one thing that I really noticed uh, especially was that although they may have low self-esteem at this point, although other people may not trust them or that, they do have skills, but most of those skills they haven't used for a while. Right. They've been into other things that got them in prison rather than utilizing their own skills. So if they could, you know, reach back and touch upon those skills that they already have, like a lot of men that I know can really fix things well. Yeah. You know, I never could. So I was, <laughs> so I was always an outlier in that field, but a lot of men can, can fix things. And a lot of people need things fixed during the pandemic, for instance, yeah. and to give them an opportunity to volunteer, to help people fix things that are broken that aren't easily replaced because of the problems we have with shipping and all these other sort of things uh, can be a great way to do that. Some of them are artistic, you know, uh, and they can do things with music and with art. And if we can get them involved in that, 
uh, that would be terrific. Yeah, well, even in prison, they said, no, this is gonna cost a lot of money to get somebody to come into the prison and it's a medical thing to have a tattoo. I said, you are loaded with artists, tattoo artists in prison. I mean, that's, that's, they're not allowed to do it, but they do it anyway. And they just have fabulous uh, artwork. You know, I told them, I said, make Christmas cards, sell those, get those to your family. Um, so yeah, the, yes. Yeah, and those are special, you know? Every, you know, we do so much online and there's so little connection of us you know, even before the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we were much less in touch with people uh, and much more in touch with them virtually rather than in person. Yeah. And something special about that Christmas card coming in the mailbox that I think, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is not just an email or a text that somebody's sending me. They're thinking enough about me where they're sending me something that is beautiful. Yeah. And when, when they let me back into Halava, they locked me out of Halava for two years. I went to Wayava the whole time. But when I went back to uh, Wayava, one of, um, you know, we go in the chapel area and then there's a visitor's area. And there was a man with, I, I presume his wife, and a, I don't know, a 10 year old, 12 year old little boy that he hadn't, his son, he hadn't seen for two years. Can you imagine? Isn't that just horrible? Yeah, exactly. And what does a person say to that son that they hadn't seen in two years? And I'm guessing that that's something that uh, your rap group could probably help them with. You Absolutely. know, talking about how do you communicate with people? How do you communicate with, uh, how do you rap to people that you haven't seen in a long time? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's what gets back to maturity again, too, is that these men, uh, every man will say, well, I'm not coming back. Uh, and then I'll say, okay, well, what's going to be different this time? And, and then we get down to, you don't go back to the old neighborhood, you don't hang with the same friends. You, I, and I said, what are you going to do for fun? If you drank and did drugs, uh, uh, for your good time, Charlie's, what are you going to do now? If you think that that's what uh, fun is, do you have a plan? Does that mean you can never go to a party again? What, what is your plan? So, you know, all this kind of stuff is uh, things that they can be thinking of for sure. Yeah, and of course, for many years, uh, as Tony knows, I worked in substance abuse counseling. And uh, if you go out, and you leave prison and you celebrate with drugs or alcohol, you're very likely to wind up with a DUI, which will send you back to prison. It's a violation of your parole. Or you're likely to wind up in a busted party with drugs available, which also violates your parole. And boom, you're right back in Halava or OCCC or wherever, uh, back in the system again. And uh, that was always, uh, you know, they said, you know, I would get sort of the light bulb that would come up. And they would think about that and say, yeah. And then later on, they'd forget about it. <laughs> and, and they get pressure from, if they go back to the old group, they get, no, nobody wants to be the last smoker or the last drinker or the last drug user. So they don't want you to leave the, the group. Yeah. So they and how do you help them deal with that? With that pressure? They, they just have to decide what their priority is. You know, and I tell them, hey, if you come back here and this is the lifestyle you're used to and you know how it works and you, you belong here and you know how to work it for you, so be it. But if you don't want to come back here, then you have to start over again. You're a baby and find friends. I said, find friends. Volunteer. Again, that's where you're going to meet nice people. Volunteers do what they do, not for pay, not for glamour, not for notoriety they do it because they have big hearts and those are the people you want to hang with yeah absolutely yeah. uh tony i noticed we're uh running down on our time we've got our half hour show goes by very quickly but uh since we're getting toward the end maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this makes you feel good make it uh, a little you know how did we've been doing it for 38 years you must get reinforced a lot uh, and have kept it at it for 30, 38 years. So uh, 
tell us a little bit about the joy so that people can understand that you know they are they are nice people that love me so I t- when people say, oh, aren't you afraid to go in there? And do you know, have they killed people? Are they robbers? You know, I said they're they're the same, the same person that lived next door to you. Only this now they're not on drugs and they're not drunk, and I get to go into prisons where there's however many men that love me. And I said, I'm I'm an old lady, but to them I'm good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tony, to me, you're always good looking too. So (laughs) that's terrific. Well, and it truly gives me a sense of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So what's up in the future? What uh, are things, how are things going to change? I mean, they've changed already. Like you said, Uh, you couldn't get into the lava for two years because of the coronavirus. Right. Are we going to do things differently? And if we are, what are some of the different things that we might be able to do in the future with, to help inmates? I think that all of these major changes that our country needs now, and I think it was Barack Obama that uh, spelled it out for me, it's got to come from the grassroots. It's got to be when, when somebody gets out, you say, okay, we'll come over to my house for lunch or uh, let me volunteer. You know, they even have classes how to teach men to write a check or uh-huh. fill up a job applicant. Well, I guess you did that, yeah? Well, I was, yeah, I was sort of doing, uh, not particularly that, but I was doing more of uh, psychological, you know, therapy sessions. Yeah. So it's but been, yeah, you definitely need those skills. Otherwise, how are you gonna survive out there? And so it's not complicated and you don't need to be uh, as educated and qualified as you are, as wonderful as that is. Um, just to pat them on the back, shake their hand, look them in the eye, have a conversation with them, have a meal with them, you know, give them examples. A lot of these men don't know anything. Well, if somebody gets in your face, you punch them. That's what they grew up with. So, you know, and talk about the light bulbs going on for them to say, oh yeah, I never thought of it that way. You know, just. Well, I hope that uh, not only they, but uh, the audience also thinks of it uh, that way as well. And I see we've really went out of, run out of time. And Tony, I just really appreciate you coming here. It's like I said at the beginning, I think that our inmates here are the forgotten population and they're easy to sort of set aside. And you've been working so well with them over the years and doing so much good that uh, I can't thank you enough, uh, not only for, you know, for them as well as for me. Uh, it's been terrific. Uh, and I hope that we can talk Tony into coming back uh, to another program sometime to talk to us about tobacco cessation, a, a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart as well. But yeah. Tony, thank you again. My pleasure. And just one more reminder, they are not throwaway people. Yeah. They're that's Ohana. They're Ohana. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you again, Tony. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And thanks to the staff at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, thanks to Eric and to Haley and to Jay and everybody who helped make this program possible. And I hope to see you again in two weeks. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.